um, data in some sense. None of these are raw data, of course. There's a plate reconstruction. There's an interpretation of a seismic section. Some, what is that? Some tomography over here and some interpretation of tomography over there. But from the point of view of someone developing numerical codes, these are um, very much closer to data than the things on the left-hand side, which are outputs of models. Uh, but they're sort of lined up a little bit. There's a, you know, the, here's a, a model which is um, of a crustal deformation designed to have some uh, relationship to things over here uh, in, in things you might interpret in, the, in a seismic section. Uh, <clears throat> at the bottom here, we have uh, a model of some subduction zone processes, and they sort of map in a way to what one is interested in when, when constructing things on a plate scale. Um, very large scale processes, I suppose, um, and involving both the deformation of the lithosphere, the uppermost parts of the lithosphere, and the crustal parts, and um, saying really very strongly that we can't say much about that unless we really understand mantle processes and how they all interact. But the point was, we put this thing in the middle here, which was to say if you're interested in something at, at one scale, you really have to understand what's happening both at the well, you have to understand what's happening at the plate scale in order to under, you know, in order to be able to model it. Not to exclusively to be able to understand everything, but I, we, you know, truly believe that those processes happen at multiple scales. Um, and of course, we also believe that the coupling goes the other way. So at the time, we were saying, well, <clears throat> we also need to understand how the loadings can be transported around by the surface processes in such a system. I'm. I'm going to talk about the geodynamics component of this, but this is to set the scene as to how I think all this fits together. So that the uh, so here is some sort of sense that um, you know the textbook pictures we have of what the how the Earth works are, I mean, they're actually quite a good description as far as we know. But the difficulty comes in turning these sort of swirly arrows, convection currents, and slabs going into the interior of the Earth into an explanation of how plate tectonics moves around in the way that it does in order to make, to make models which utilize plate boundary conditions or uh, plate ob observables at the plate scale um, to utilize those to drive models and to understand processes. Uh, there are many things on this slide, you know, and only some of them are Gonna, I'm going to talk about, but nonetheless, you know, we have a lot of constraints, um, but they're sort of constraints that that uh, loosely skip across the top of um, of some of the models that we can create. Although they are pertinent, it's hard for us unless we can um, unless we have a basic understanding of a lot of the uh, physics and can model it all together with the geometry. Um, we have a real problem making these things engaging with these, with these data. And so part of this program that we've been involved with has been to improve our modeling capacity in both the ability to model the geometry and the ability to model the, well, underlying physical processes. Most of that boils down to things like the rheology. Um, I've just flown in from Australia. And you know, in a sense, uh, we're trying to make sense there of something where we see the end completely see the end results and very little else. Right? There's not much that's happening. You know, here is here is the sort of geological map of Australia in a cartoon form. Um, <clears throat> you know, left of this line, everything is Archean or Proterozoic, and and right of that line, it's not. Um, but this is all pretty old now, and it's just a bunch of accreted stuff. You can see in the tomography that we know a little bit about the structure there, but we're not seeing active processes. We, we need to understand what happened. We don't see very much going on right now. This is rather a difficulty. So one of the, th one of the things we've been looking at, for example, is uh, how do we uh, understand, well, I, I'm living down here somewhere, um, and this is in the midst of a whole bunch of accreted terrains. And so our understanding of that is through things like this, which is a model. Um, in which we are, you know, sort of trying to understand. Um, well, if we actually have some terrain and a continental block over here, you know, what actually is happening in this system? And if we can understand basically to model it, 
then we can understand somehow um, then we can start to understand how these systems really did work back in the day if you like and this is um, I'm going to have to jump back and forth between this to show you the movie again but this is essentially this kind of a fragment is on the it's actually on the far side of the model is over here collides into the continent and we see a very different we see you know propagation of deformation we see all sorts of things which are in our geological record but we need to we need to see those through these dynamic models in order to understand the processes of what happened and the advantage of the models is that in, in interpreting very old terrains we can start to look at you know where this is uh, the strain rate field and uh, so we can start to look at the historical strain rate field where really at the end of it all we see is the strain and we can look at the stresses when all we can see at the end of it is really just the results of those applied stresses so these models we're starting to build this is the end result of course and it's the closest thing I have these days to the central point of that uh, diagram so I'm using it as uh, uh, to stand in for the cartoon I original, originally drew but it turns out that this has all the pertinent features of that I can look at the formation of um, you know, where basins would form where crust thickens and so on of course we now have to work out how to start these models to get those to get to those endpoints but we can really start to understand how to engage with um, the geological map and of course we did this for Australia so we created terrains and things are an important point now what I what I want to do next is to show you this is this is really setting the scene for why we did some of these things and some of our more um, you know my showing that we actually got to the point that we wanted to be at um, well we're nearly there actually I mean I'm, I'm here today because of some of the things that we still need to do let me talk about numerical methods because the numerical methods here are um, they're no longer brand new but they're still they're still um, seem to be one of the best things for the job and so let's just talk about um, some of the ideas behind this so my original uh, work was in mantle convection so really looking at the fluid dynamics of the deep earth and typically we'd look at things like this this is a, a Rayleigh Bernard convection model and um, Anyway, it's only it's controlled by the single parameter of Rayleigh number here. It's um, there's no no uh, complicated rheology. It's a pure and old-fashioned uh, fluid dynamics calculation, which you can understand very very well through scaling theory. Um, anyway, it's described by this, this single parameter and a Rayleigh number of ten to the five. It reaches a a beautiful steady state in which there is no real fluctuation in temperature or uh, in the velocity field over time. Nevertheless, of course, there is a gigantic strain for any part of the material that's in there. There is a large, a large strain. We can put in markers, die essentially into the fluid and watch as this turns into tendrils. At higher Rayleigh numbers, we get more uh, elaborate stirred patterns. And we can understand these things in terms of boundary layer theory and so on. And I, of course, use these things as little projects. They're very easy to follow and. and um, uh, and people can really understand what's what's happening in them easily. Um, the point is, though, that they, you know, they're, they're, they're modeled they're modeled and understood in terms of the behavior of boundary layers and things which are not fixed into the fluid. The fluid passes through, transports heat, transports, um, you know, and is and, and creates some sort of circulation. And we don't really care much about which parcel of fluid is doing what. So most of the time we're thinking here in a laboratory frame in which stuff is happening and the fluid is simply passing through creating this system. That, that lends us to a sort of a certain fluid dynamical way about, of thinking about the, the, um, the numerics as well. And one, of the way, one of the ways we can do this is, is very efficient solutions on a fixed mesh. And, and the mantle convection community has classically been very focused on structured meshes uh, <clears throat> those meshes being fixed. Sometimes we're interested in adaptive meshing to focus on boundary layers and so on, but often not. 
um, and very, very focused on the other part of this, which is that we're, we're talking about a creeping flow Stokes-like system, uh, which can be solved very efficiently with things like multigrid. Uh, you know, it's a quasi-static process in the end that you're looking at. Uh, it has a lot in common with doing elastic, uh, you know, solving elastic problems and so on. It has a, it's a way of thinking. This is a picture I just showed earlier, essentially a model which is designed to look at deformation of the crust, I suppose. The uppermost layering here is a sort of uh, a um, visco viscoelastic plastic material. And this is a numerical model. It's, it's, uh, I used a color scheme and so on here to make it actually look like a sandbox model because it was written, it was uh, designed to, uh, for a sort of benchmarking exercise. But it, you know, it creates these interesting shear bands, and you can see here this is a, an extended block, so it forms what are essentially normal faults in this problem. They're very localized. If, you, if you're interested in faulting processes, then I guess these are not faults for you because they're very broad. Um, but on a scale of the entire system, they're relatively narrow, and you can see that they isolate individual blocks, and that's perhaps enough. Uh, to understand things at, at least um, at this scale. But, the, but what makes this possible to solve is the fact that um, the material in here and the material in the shear band here that, is, uh, that we're using to represent a fault um, have had a very different reaction to the strain. One has, uh, you know, one has, one has uh, accumulated a lot of, let's call it damage, and become very weak. Um, the other region has essentially, by, as a result of that process, has become shielded from high stresses and further strain. And so there's a bifurcation for, in, in the pathway that individual bits of material take. The history dependence of the deformation is incredibly important in this problem. And so it pushes us to tracking individual parcels of material in a way that we didn't do it for, or weren't, weren't, wasn't necessary for the fluid dynamical approach. Um, so I'll hop around a little bit now. The, um, the technique that we use for this uh, is, is a sort of a hybrid, basically to, to take a bunch of material points in blue here um, and track them during deformation. These little streaks to the points in red. We follow everything that's going on and then we keep in the background a fixed mesh, the same one actually that we use for our fluid dynamics calculations and we transfer the properties from these individual particles which record interesting history from the um, Lagrangian material points to the fixed mesh each time we take a time step uh, and each time we want to calculate some physical properties and then it's easy enough to go from the mesh points back to these other points using standard uh, interpolations at the the next time we've made an update. Uh, this is a, a version of the material point method which has been uh, developed, uh, was originally developed um, at Los Alamos um, and uh, is used widely in the materials community and we picked it up to use it in a slightly different context. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very simple to describe. If you know finite elements, it's very, very simple to describe as well because it's really just taking the integration points and moving them around. Um, the thing about it that I like is that it, lend, it lends itself to a, lot, a number of things. You, you have this capacity to describe where the material points are and have been. And so the model I showed you right at the beginning moving around is this one. Um, and I'm going to show you something about the intuitive nature of, of, the, of the methods that we've come up with, what I mean by that as we go. So for example, um, we have this collection of material points, which is exactly what I just described to you. These points in here, the yellow points, have different physical properties to the ones that are in this sort of mm, pinkish gray color. And the red points that are here and here have different buoyancy and different rheology to other points. So these ones represent um, continental ribbon trapped in an oceanic plate. This material over here is a sort of continental uh, region. 
And then I've done some other things. I've said, oh, well, my, some of my points don't have to actually carry physical properties. They can just be traces like you would use in an analog model. And these start to look a lot like analog models after a while. Um, so I've got a sort of a sheet here of, of particles which carry only color and don't do anything to the rest of the simulation. They just are there. And some here, which are little, these little squares, they're composed of little particles, but they don't carry all the history information except for their location. So they act as strain markers in the system. And I'll show you some of them later. This is sort of incidental to the method, but it turns out to be straightforward to do if you build a you know, big parallel particle moving architecture, then you can use it the second time around for something else. And so that's how these uh, diagrams came about. Here is the sheet of passive particles showing you where the, where the material points are, but in much higher resolution. And then the material points themselves are informing the, um, the strain, uh, strain rate and, and the strain history. So these points in here, you can see there's a strain rate, the strain rate is localized into here. This is forming a shear band of exactly the same form that we saw in the crustal variation as well. Um, this might be a movie, I think, let me see. Here you can see how this is a little bit. So here, what I really wanted to show you with this, if you might be interested in the science, I can talk to you about that separately. But here, what I really wanted to show you is this is the deformation of the overriding plate in a system. So it might be one of the things that we're very interested in um, using uh, to understand, you know, to, to understand more about the geology. Okay, and here, here is an indenting block. So you get a very, very interesting pattern of deformation. This is the, these are the strain markers in there, but basically we've pulled the, uh, this, we've extended this plate dramatically through here, and then we have this remarkable uh, lateral rollback of the subduction zone, which we actually believe we can see a lot of these you know, this structure in the Australian record of collision, the kinds of things that happens to these ribbons of continent that are collided one after the other and the uh, subsequent deformation. They have a very obvious pattern of extension compression uh, and the um, you know, sequence that's repetitive. And I can look into the mantle and tell you what the, the slab is doing under there as well. I haven't got that. So, this is, so here you know, we've got very, very large strains and I want to track them all because I, my interest here is actually about accretion and I don't think I've done accretion unless I can create a collision zone, have a subduction zone, collide something with it, and then recreate um, a subduction zone afterwards. In other words, put the, put the subduction, put the boundary back and allow the thing to continue, evolution, uh, continue its evolution into another cycle. So that means being able to track the, uh, both the positions of the, the subducting, subducting slabs but also the behavior of the overriding plate. So, you know, in, this is a com completely different examples from some shear experiments, but being able to track not just, you know, when some material, when some material undergoes, uh, is stressed, uh, most of what we're looking at has the possibility to localize, so it may continue on some viscoelastic, you know, the viscoelastic deformation would be up here, but most likely what happens is we reach some high stress and we begin along a weakening branch, and uh, we have to follow in this direction. This direction is dependent on the strain history. In other words, this is the stress strain rate diagram. We also can look at that in a stress strain diagram. And that stress strain diagram means that some materials, some materials have one path, become shear bands, and some materials have another path in which they are sort of excluded, they, they never really will reach, will never reach too far beyond here because they're shielded from their stress pattern. And I can see James signaling to me that I have limited time. So I'm going to sketch through some of these to show you that you know, the, the techniques we, we use can, tr can track um, material, you know, this, this distinct histories. Okay. You can do that in two dimensions and in three dimensions, very complicated. Um, all right, that's a, a bit of history. Um, this was 
this is interesting because this is the best the best I could um, do in terms of uh, coupled crust mantle deformation at the time. I drew this diagram, but now I believe that we've ne we've reached the point where you know these kinds of things are possible. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit this part about uh, intuition, but talk to you very very briefly about the fact that. The other, the other thing I mentioned was that we need to be able to represent data um, as well in order to be able to make sense of uh, the connection between the models that we're running and the things that constrain them. So within exactly the same framework that I just showed you, here is, here is um, a way that we've been building models automatically. So what we do here is we are pulling in geometry from here, for example, known MOHO depth and depth to the LAB to construct the material point initial conditions, if you like, the initial uh, state of those points, you know, whether they are in the mantle or you know, here the asthenosphere, whether they're to be considered lithosphere. Uh, this is the seismicity, and this is, uh, this is the Southern California, you see the San Andreas Fault running along here. This is simply the surface trace extended to depth, and I can show you that, um, I'm going to do that in a moment. Uh, I can show you that we've then taken that, those, uh, here we go, we, we've taken some um, receiver function data to find where these layerings transfer one type of particle to another. And we can take the surface trace of the, of the faults and use those to project down to influence the behavior of the material points. Okay, so we can do a lot of fun stuff using exactly the same infrastructure. Um, and we can do that. Here's an example. I'm going to skip the context for that. But here's an example where we did exactly the same thing using somebody else's GoCAD model, uh, which was built an enormous amount of detail to map into what the material points are doing. And so this is kind of where we're at with building structurally realistic models, if you like, and then putting boundary conditions on them which come potentially from these plate models uh, to look and see how the stresses um, influence. Um, it could be fluid flow, it could be um, fault reactivation and so on. All right, so our current situation is that we have spent a lot of effort to build things which can, can match observations in one form or another and we're focused quite a lot on whether we can um, do these things fast enough to have some sort of interaction with um, model building and model uh, ingestion. And that kind of thing. In terms of this community, um, we have been working with uh, the group at CSIRO to um, couple their TELUS surface process code to Underworld. And the one thing that we've learned with this is that uh, we had to basically make sure we were writing both things at the same time because it was very hard. We wanted to impose enormous amounts of deformation. You can see from those things that I showed you. The lateral deformations in particular are really significant. And they're on a very, very large scale and relatively smooth. And so we have to, we have to essentially transfer a smooth but very large, very large strain, you know, overall eventual strain field between uh, our model and the surface process model to tell us what it's doing. What it's doing. Going back the other way is relatively straightforward, but it's that sense of being able to have high density information deforming it in, you know, uh, incrementally, but eventually by a very large amount that has proved to be the interesting part of this process. Um, and we have, you know, th this thing is relatively lightweight compared to doing that full three-dimensional calculation. So to summarize, um, we're starting to get to the point where we can do these continental deformation problems um, as sort of fundamental outputs of understanding the basic plate processes. There's much more to be done in that regard. It's not finished, but we're getting quite good at it. So we can model the interactions of continents and mantles, quite, mantle processes quite well. Of course, in this, we're, we're relying mostly on buoyancy forces and their transmission through very nonlinear um, a very nonlinear lithosphere. So the simple flow becomes quite complicated in its, in its expression at the surface. And for that reason, uh, anything that redistributes those buoyancies 
is going to be important uh, to include in the in the calculation. Uh, if we're going to well to do this problem to do this coupled problem, we have very significant lateral tectonic motions that accompany any vertical motions we produce, um, and there are likely feedbacks through thermal effects, which uh, we haven't got. I mean, which is really a very cutting-edge problem, actually, when it comes to understanding how this part of this part of the interaction can be modelled. We know it's important how it works, but in terms of modelling it, it's actually um, it's hard to initialise this problem and make it work well. So that's uh, this is kind of where we're at in terms of that. All right. So thank you very much. How well is the rheology uh, known of uh, these materials? Um, it's, uh, it's not very well understood under the appropriate conditions. So we know, and we know indirectly, most of we know indirectly. So we can make lab measurements of rheology on samples, but uh, we don't necessarily know exactly what the appropriate conglomerate that's, that we're deforming really should be. Um, we know that there's dependencies on things like grain size, which is another history um, variable, which we don't really necessarily know, uh, you know how to initialize for models like this. And we also know that we have very big difference in, you know, in, in terms of the timescales of the experiments that are done in the laboratory compared to the ones that are done in the mantle. And we often see, we often, as a result of that, see a conflict between um, things which, like, like uh, gravity observations, which constrain the rheology quite well, and the rheology that's predicted by lab experiments. We often have to reinterpret one in terms of the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I liked your simulations very much. They were, of course, very impressive. I had one question. Did you have a deformable upper boundary, or was the upper boundary flat? Uh, these are cases with a flat upper boundary, so okay. it reflects, it's essentially squashing down the topography that we make and replacing it with a, you know, a, a, a stress, which is a proxy for the deformation. So you don't see uh, 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 upfolding of uh, mountain ranges or things well, like you, that? Well, we predict it, but we don't... Um, explicitly model it. So as long as, as long as we're predicting only the long wavelength, uh, as long as we're modeling only the long wavelength, it's not a bad approximation. Right. So um, there are a number of complexities with doing completely free surface kind of models, but, but um, one of the things we can do, for example, is to, uh, is to track that deformation, um, tra track explicitly how the vertical motions occur and use them to create um, you know, vertical boundary conditions and things. So treat it as a, as a separated problem. That, that's quite stable numerically. Thanks, Louis. Uh, we're going to move on now. So if you want to have uh, ask further questions of him and others, there is a geodynamics uh, group that will be meeting in the afternoon, and uh, he'll be pleased to take uh, your questions.